Welcome everyone to episode 50 of the New E Tech People podcast. We're a bit different today, so uh, if you might remember me back from episode number one, uh, James and I sort of kicked the thing off and we made a pact back then that if he actually made it this far and, and got into 50 episodes, uh, I'd come back and interview him. So our special guest today is James McDonald. James, good to have you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. A bit different it sitting is, on the man. other side. It is. Uh, and uh, making it 50 episodes is very solid. A couple of years in, right? Two years two ago. Two years. Now. Just about two years ago, yeah. We were in right. the, the lift and go offices or what is now the lift and go offices. Okay. Uh, and now we're over at Inks yeah. in Paris Street. So. That's it. Moving up. Moving up. Okay, so I mean, I guess for those that don't know you or if this is the first time they've listened to your podcast, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, who are you? Where have you been? What's your journey? Yeah, let, let us know. So, obviously, James McDonald. I, uh, I'm a recruiter, tech recruiter in Newcastle, co-owner of New Tech People brand. Um, started a podcast two years ago. Background before recruitment was marketing. Uh, that was my sort of life prior to recruitment and then sort of fell into fell into recruitment. We might go into that if you want a little bit later. Yeah, we'll that touch happened. on that for sure. So, yeah, I kicked off this podcast two years ago and the whole objective really just to try to shine some light on what's going on in the Newcastle scene, highlight a few of the, the personalities or both, yeah, the personalities and also the projects that are going on in Newcastle. So, it's been going for two years now, which definitely wouldn't have happened without uh, all the people behind the scenes. If this was me editing and me putting it out, uh, we wouldn't have made it past episode five, I don't think. So uh, thanks to Janae Little, who is uh, the person behind the scenes who edits everything, films everything and uh, records it. So shout out, Janae. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, so tell us about the transition from marketing to recruitment. Like what, why did that occur? Why, why did you decide to go that way? Yeah, I don't think anyone sets out to be in recruitment, right? <laughs> That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. A bit <laughs> of a dirty word, huh? It's, it is a dirty word. We can touch on that. Yeah, we will. Like we will. We'll go into that. Um, so yeah, my life was, I uh, did, yeah, my whole life was marketing. I uh, did a uh, Bachelor of Business at Newcastle Uni. I majored in marketing, went to Sydney, lived down there for six or seven years. Online marketing manager at an events company and then through the GFC, we're right in another mm. pandemic now that uh, that company went under. Joined Robert Half, which was a recruitment company. Uh, wasn't doing any recruiting there, but I was online marketing manager, so played in the SEO, PPC, Email marketing was hot back then. I was doing a bit of that, learning myself some HTML. Okay. Thought I knew what, you know, how to code at that stage. And then my wife and I fell pregnant and moved back to the Central Coast to be close to, to family. And I was commuting to the city for a little bit. On the side, I'd built a few websites, um, but I built a few websites. So we're WordPress sites. Are they still around? One of them is still, okay. still around, um, only because I haven't shut it down. So a couple, of, a couple of training websites and we sold some online training programs and I sort of customized the back end of it, set up some drip fed content, that type of thing. And during that time, I was spending a bit of money with Facebook. So we were making a, a, a reasonable amount of money. I spent quite a bit of money there with Facebook, got to know the head of small business at Facebook in Australia. And just funnily enough, he was doing some consulting with Foresight's recruitment and uh, they wanted to launch a tech brand. And he was doing some consulting there. He knew of some guy that just moved back to the coast, didn't want to be commuting to Sydney anymore. And that's how I fell into recruitment. They're like, hey, do you want to have a crack at this recruitment thing? You seem to know a bit about technology. Yep. And that's where it started. The rest is history, huh? Okay. And then you went out on your own in 2017 off the back of that? Yeah, mate. Um, I had some really good times there, sort of learned my trade, if, that, if that's what, how you put it. Yeah. Enjoyed my time there. And then... As my family was growing, uh, three kids now, I was, uh, I was coming up to baby number three. I, was, uh, I got presented an opportunity to sort of go out on my own, um, start my own thing. Yeah. Um, it was probably always, probably always, I guess, a goal of, of mine at some point to sort of have ownership of something. And it was right, well, maybe not right time, right place. Like it was, I literally left and went out on my own two weeks before my third baby was due. Wow. Jeez. And uh, must be scary. It was scary. It was yeah. scary. Um, I don't mind taking a risk. My wife would probably think otherwise. <laughs> uh, there's some, yeah, there's, but it was a risk with a, with a, there was a, there was a bit of a, a net there. So I had, did have, it wasn't, it was a model where I was provided a salary as well when I had on mine. So it wasn't completely, I had ownership of the business, but there was a safety net there from a salary, which uh, okay. was the only reason I think I was allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah, right. And you've been involved in the startup scene, so I guess it's a bit, a bit like starting your own startup, really, and, yeah. and building that up. Yeah, I love yourself. the startup scene. So when I came to Newcastle, I uh, the Newcastle recruitment scene, I was I was new to the party. I mm. I thought I knew what I was talking about. And I quickly realised I didn't. I remember uh, walking into there's two two meetings in particular that stand out. Mine was on um, a software company on the Central Coast. I walked in. 
And I said, oh, yeah, I know a little bit of software development. <laughs> I, know, I know a little bit of how to code. I HTML? I, yeah, I think I said I, how to code. He's like, oh, front end or back end? I was like, what, this, this, what, what do you mean? <laughs> um, I'd done some basic HTML, right? I, I learned some HTML when I had to customize some emails, um, and like email marketing, and then a little bit from a WordPress perspective, I thought, oh, I know what I'm talking about here. Mm. Mm. So I was quickly put in my place there. And then um, one meeting at the TAFE, up here in Newcastle, I went in there, I was taking my first ever job brief uh, for a .NET developer. And he, I, was, I, saw it, I was going through it, I was, I was seeing this C hash sign. I was like, oh, C hash, <laughs> oh, I think I know what I'm learning this, learning yeah, the lingo. Yeah. Quickly, quickly found out <laughs> C hash wasn't a thing. Well, I, once I found out what C sharp was, I thought, oh, I, you know, I know, I know what I'm talking about now. Yeah. So, <laughs> mate, six years ago now, so. Yeah, wow. Well. And and why technology? I guess you ask you ask everyone why technology. Why why did why were you attracted to that specifically? Yeah, I, I so marketing was my background, I guess, and marketing all went digital. Um, so I had an interest in obviously websites and, and what was going on online from a dollars perspective. Making money was you know, was going to be online at some point in the future. Um, and then I had a bit of an interest on you know how how that's going to evolve. What am I going to do? I didn't want to sort of be a dinosaur in my life going forward. I figured that I have to sort of move with the times and. And I sort of got lucky, fell into, you know, the, the right place at the right, right time with four sites. So, yeah, man, a little bit of right place, right time, a little bit of, hey, I I put myself in a position by building those sites, by learning that on my own to, to be the right place, right time. So, you know, a little bit of luck, a little bit of make your own luck. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. So, but, mate, since then, I've the more I get into it, the more I learn, I enjoy it. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, so recruiters, let's, let's talk about recruiters. Sometimes they're a dirty word. Um, I know particularly when you've got a recruiter showing up at a meetup or a conference and, uh, you know, it always gets a few groans and a few eye rolls. And so um, I guess what, what are your thoughts on that? But also what have, what have you done personally to sort of, you know, uh, push against that image or I guess grow um, uh, and educate people around yeah, recruiters? Yeah, so I, I completely own that. I think um, maybe for the first I would at least be six months, maybe a year. I was in recruitment, and if I went to went somewhere and met somebody new, what do you do? Um, I'm a marketer. <laughs> if my wife and I went somewhere for at a party, oh yeah, I do marketing. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. tell people I did recruitment. Definitely had that sort of that used car salesman type. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. It, hey, it is right, and 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 that that thought is there, uh, and it's there for a reason because it's a, it's a pretty shitty industry sometimes with some of the practices that people do, and there's no point running away from that. But the longer I've been in it, the more I figured out, hey, you don't have to act that way. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to be that, that used car salesman. I mean, you don't have to be sort of leeching off the industry. That's the way I look at it. A lot of recruiters out there are, you know, cold calling people, uh, you know, floating resumes without, you know, having met somebody, uh, are hitting people up for completely irrelevant jobs, not done any homework. It's just sort of there is a low barrier to entry to get into recruitment, so you yeah, can right. see why it happens, right? And people in a lot of the bigger organisations, recruitment organisations, are KPI'd on how many calls you make, how many, you know, those, those KPIs mm. around that, which just sets up bad behaviour, I think. So uh, when right. I first come into the Newcastle market, I was, I was new, so there were some established players. So I went about it from... The startup scene. We started a, a meetup, new tech startup, new tech and startups. Yeah. I think it was called back then. And I know you came to a couple of our, our early meetings there. And I thought, hey, if I can help build a bit of a community around this. One of my mates was working at Braintree at the time, owned by PayPal. Yeah, he had a sponsorship budget, so we got <laughs> him to come along and sponsor it. So he sponsored, put on the beers. Him and Force us like co co did that, put on the beers, and uh. Sort of started to build a community around that. And new startups as an event probably probably went for like a year, uh, at least two or three years. Um, over the last two years, it's probably been extremely sporadic, if if that. Um, so I just tried to help build the community. I figured um, if I can help build the community and I'm a part of that, adding to the community, then I'm seen as not not somebody leeching on the community, but somebody that's helped bigging it up. Then I'll be seen in a different way. And I, and I genuinely felt better about that i was like i can feel happy about hey i'm providing value to the community here i'm not and if i'm doing that i feel good about what i'm doing i think you know in general you can sort of position yourself slightly different to what most recruiters are viewed as yeah yeah 
So it sounds like building community was a big part of, of the principles that you put in place for yourself. Did you have any other rules or principles that you sort of set out with and said, oh, I'm not going to cold call people or I'm not going to do the, you know, LinkedIn messages three or four times? Like, what, what were those sort of rules you put in place yeah, for yourself? Yeah, I, I was lucky that I wasn't KPI'd like that early. Yep. Um, so I, I was lucky the environment I was in wasn't, wasn't like that. So I didn't have to go out and make X amount of cold calls um, because – I just wouldn't enjoy that as well. Like I want to enjoy what I do for a, a day job. And if I've got to come in and cold call people, like mm. what value is that? No one wants to be cold called. If I get a cold call from somebody and they're not providing value to me, I'm like, well, get, you know, get off my phone. Like <laughs> I, I value my time, right? <laughs> so um, I, was I was lucky from that perspective that I, I, I wasn't put in that situation where I had to do that. And then I think it's just, you know, it, my other thing I try, to, I try to think about, I guess if you think about values or whatever, is just play the long game. Yeah. As in like maybe there's a fee or two I could have got earlier days if I pushed something a little bit harder or I tried to squeeze a client, hey, you know, you owe me this or this or that or try to play by the, the letter of the, you know, the contract or whatever. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's better off just playing for that long-term relationship. Hey, you know, have a little bit of flexibility here and there, play for that long game. Hey, you might not get a fee right now. Uh, also, like, you know, I think I, I knew you. I knew a lot of people like yourself for, for many years before I ever, we ever did work together. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you provide value to people and you build long-term relationship and it's not about, you know, can, can I get some money out of this person or anything like that, it's actually about just build a long-term relationship and the time comes, yeah. you know, things have a funny way of turning themselves around, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I think that long game um, a principle or approach is, is a really important one. I mean, it applies to everything, right, um, in, in your career and in your work and, if you're focused on that that vision or where you want to get to, um, you, you won't compromise you know, along the way. And yeah, I remember when we first met. You know, it was uh, it was at one of the meetups, but then it, it quickly sort of turned into a, a potential job or a potential offer. And um, and I did end up turning that down after you know a pretty intense process, as as you all remember. And I nearly um, cried that day. <laughs> I nearly cried a number of times that day as well. But uh, I thought we'd never speak again. You know, after that, yeah. and and I just thought, oh well, look. Um, that's the way recruiters are and, and you just sort of, you know, turn them down and, and you've made an enemy and you don't want to talk to that yeah. person anymore. But yeah, look, I think it's been a credit to you. You've obviously focused on on that long game and, and building those relationships up and, you know, here we are. So um, yeah, good stuff. And, and do you think the podcast is has been part of, um, uh, I guess, giving back to the community, giving building that brand up? Um, you know, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, about 100%. That? So podcasts, I, again, I guess it's probably my marketing background, right? I probably... I probably do attack things from a marketing background. That, that's, you know, that's what I learned for, you know, 10, 10 odd years. And, my, and podcasts, podcasts is a good, really good marketing medium, right? Uh, the way I have approached it though, like I have never sold recruitment on the podcast. It's not sponsored by, you mm. know, there's no, there's no hey jobs post or something at the end of the, each podcast episode. There's no me talking about me and recruitment. Like I try to make it very much about the guests because the audience for me, our, our our audience for the New Tech People podcast is the tech community. So they want to hear from other people in the tech community, find out what projects they're working on, how do they get into their position. Hey, what did Matt Finch do in his early career to get to where he's at right now, that type of scenario. So that's what I've tried to make the podcast about the community, me being associated with that, right? Like I'm, mm. not, I'm not Mother but Teresa, right? Like <laughs> it's not a complete just me giving it back. Like there's that obviously – me being associated with that, me getting to meet a lot of really influential people in the Newcastle tech community helps me. Yep. Um, I also find it interesting. I'm like, hey, as again, like if I was, if I wouldn't, I'd be a really, really shit employee if I was to work for a big corporate recruitment company forced to KPI on cold calls and how many candidate CVs I can send out each day. I just wouldn't be good at that. What I do enjoy is having a conversation with people and if I can do that on a podcast, man, Happy days. I enjoy it. Um, it provides value to the community. Hopefully, provides you know value to the community, and then it helps build my brand. Obviously, off the back of that, so it all ties in. Yeah, right. So take us right back to the beginning. Where where did you get the idea for the podcast? Like, how, how did this come along? And I know we talked before. You sort of listened to a number of big podcasters out there. I mean, what 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 was the influence? I guess and the inspiration for you from a marketing days. I was a bit of a Gary V fanboy. Like Gary Vaynerchuk's a he's a pretty influential guy in the marketing in the marketing realm. One of his things, so what, I think it was one of his, it was his recent book. It was like a redo of his original book, Crush. It was called Crushing It. One of the examples he gives is like, if you become the person, like the local media place for your for your industry, um, you can help build a community around that. And if you're seen to be a key part of that, 
So I'm not, you know, I didn't come up with this idea. It's like the podcast isn't brand new. There's thousands of, well, millions of podcasts out there, right? Like I haven't reinvented the wheel. I've just gone super niche. Yep. I've gone people, people, why, why would you do tech in Newcastle? Why would you call it new tech people? Like A, tech's a niche. B, Newcastle's a niche. Why yep. would you do it so niche? And, was that intentional, that sort of focus yeah. on niche? Yeah, yeah. I'm a massive, massive fan of depth over width. Yep. So I go deep in something as opposed to going sort of short and solid across across everything so and we've built a, a good solid business here now we're up to four people here now in tech in newcastle right which won't a lot of people would be like that's crazy crazy yeah. talk so yeah. hey it might have its limitations down the track but then we'll, we'll deal with that then but yeah massive depth if you can provide if you know what you're talking about right it provides a heap more value i, I if a recruiter comes in and they say they're a specialist in tech sales marketing accounting and whatever else which yeah. a lot of them do oh yeah. yeah i'm a specialist across them I'm like get the hell out of here right? Right. yeah and they put a java developer for, <laughs> for a javascript role and then they you know it, it gets some c hashes getting around some c hashes yeah and that gets <laughs> out that way and that happens real quick right you get found out right so i think hey if, you, if you've got some solid knowledge in that space uh, you can help provide value to that industry yeah right. So um, you sort of touched on it a little bit, but but how's the new tech people brand grown? I guess from you know the early days in the podcast, you've talked about the staff growing. Um, uh, got any podcast numbers, views you can share with us? Like, what got some metrics you can throw Ooh, out there? We've got fifty episodes. I know those okay. metrics. That's good. Um, that's good. I'd probably have to hit up Janae for that one. Yeah, I don't know the exact numbers. So. The it's other, grown. It's grown. One hundred percent, it's grown. Yeah. And we're looking at we're looking at a couple hundred listeners for each episode, right? Yeah. Which I think, by you know, big international podcast standards, is, is horrendous, right? But for our standards, I think it ticks a box, right? Oh, it's great. Hey, yeah. If there's if there's three hundred people in the Newcastle technology scene that want to listen to a you know forty five minute fifty episode once a fortnight for what we are doing, I take that as a massive compliment. I've yep. got gratitude for people to actually take their time out of their day to actually listen to that. I'm like, hey, if if that, if that happens, I'm super stoked to continue to invest in podcasts, continue to invest in sort of help building the community. Um, for me, it's once again, it's probably that depth over with. It's like, hey, you could do something in a broader category and maybe get more numbers, but what value does that provide? Yeah, I yep. question it. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a good lead on. I mean, you live locally here in, in Newcastle. So, I guess, what's, what's your opinion on the Newcastle tech scene? You know, you've got this, uh, you've got these listeners, you're building up the community. Like, where's the Newcastle tech scene at in, in your Newcastle mind? tech scene in six years, I think six years now, I've been recruiting here. It's grown significantly, right? On a couple of folds. I think back in the days, there would have been, for candidates, I'll say for tech, people in the tech community, I think there's probably four big options. It probably would have been the uni and I'd be the greater in the perm mm. as potential, you know, technology options or technology yeah. teams in Newcastle. And that would have been the options back in the days. It's like, oh, once you've done one, if you leave one, go to the other. You've only got two left, right? <laughs> Small world, right? I've got a long career ahead of me and I've, <laughs> I've taken two. Oh. Yeah, um, that's right. So I think I think what's changed is is the rise in sort of yeah, those guys are still there. The rise in that sort of that level under and companies growing tech teams to, you know, a dozen two dozen people so you know 20 person tech teams a pretty significant team and there's a bunch of companies around there doing that and there's a bunch of traditional newcastle companies that are now investing in technology yeah. they would have been traditional and they're like hey we're not going to be around unless we invest in technology and then there's there's a you know there's a small but growing startup scene as well when i first started here you know some of the startups that are now you know pretty solid and building solid teams were ideas or were going through incubators the likes of Lift and go, Camplify, Switch, Dim, Decky. Those guys were sort of the, some of those. A lot, or some of them went through the early slingshot programs, but, but a lot of those, you know, were ideas or, or one man, two man bands back then. And most of those, or at least three of those four I just mentioned, have got teams that are two dozen now, right? Yeah. And they've got you know multiple rounds of funding. So again, those grow. Pegasus just raised like thirty eight mil, I think. Yeah, that's right. Acquisition too, right? Yeah. So like they're 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 doing phenomenally. So. I think the Newcastle tech scene in general is really solid. Like there's there's a lot going on. There's some super intelligent people here working on some good projects. Like I think if I would have had a conversation with the likes of yourself or other people six years ago, there'd be a point where you'd tap out. You'd be like, I've got to go to Sydney for work. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get work on cool projects. Or I'm not going to get to do X, Y, Z if I stay locally. But some of the tech being done here locally is like it's phenomenal now. It's, yeah. It's world class in some stages, so 
I think it's more opportunity for people to do some cool stuff locally and not have to move away. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I mean, when I moved back here from the States um, sort of eight years ago now, uh, yeah, there really wasn't too much around, you know, and, and it's great now that we've got uh, these startups that are sort of growing into the scale-up phase and building big teams and, mm. and then the, I guess it's really good to see. I mean, how do you think that they'll continue to evolve and, and how do we keep them in Newcastle? I think that's a, that's a big question because um, it's, it's easy for them to go, well, the, the talent's not here or, or they've got to tap out and go themselves to Melbourne or, or, yeah. or Sydney. So I think... I think a lot of those owners are overcastrians, are people that want to keep their businesses here. Yeah. Um, like if, they, if they've got a choice, they're going to keep it likely. The challenge for Newcastle is the lack of talent. Is there's a very real reason recruiters exist in Newcastle. Um, mm. It's extremely hard to hire software developers in particular. Yeah. The tech talent across the board is pretty thin. It's growing. I think COVID might have, might can probably help and hinder us. So help us from a perspective of I think there's more people realising you don't need to live in a big city anymore. There's some, you know, people that are living in Sydney to be close to work that are now able to work remotely, so they moved to Newcastle. Yep. That brings talent here, even if they're working for a Sydney company and they might look at options locally. So I think for, it'll help us from that perspective. It might hinder us from a perspective of local Newcastle talent who want to stay in Newcastle, mm-hmm. only have a, had Newcastle options in the past, but now could potentially work for a company in Sydney, Melbourne or the US. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's right. Um, I know there's a couple of guys, at least a few people, I think, are locally that um, work for US based companies yeah. and work remotely. And, you know, USD is obviously very attractive. I think that's sort of that could be a challenge again. So it'll be interesting to sort of see how it all plays out longer term. Whilst working remote has its benefits, I think there is a flip side of that, which everyone's sort of starting to see with working remote that people still do have a desire for that human interaction you know yeah. do you, when can you meet up for your team for a coffee or a little huddle or go for a beer or something like that there, there's a, a desire still for that human connectivity yeah absolutely i mean i've been um uh, at home for five months now um it's, it's been super quick i mean it feels like uh 12 months or more in, in this period and um yeah it's been a real change uh working working remotely um in that time sort of my team's double in size as well and so we've onboarded people remotely we've had to work out how we do sort of team building remotely and workshops and uh, yeah, it's a massive change. So um, it's it's going to be interesting. And, and I guess, do you have any reflections of the last sort of six months in, in you know, we, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't talk about COVID and no, pandemic no, no. and that. Um, so what are your sort of reflections on that? I guess from both from your personal recruitment and your job perspective, but also, you know, what, what you're seeing in the market, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that when it really hit that monday tuesday like the first week where they're like oh, i think we had we'll put in a lockdown back right? in march was it yeah or? march yeah, yeah. monday was a bad day yeah right i had a few offers that were at offer stage verbal offer agreed got pulled on the monday a few people that had done second round interviews were all but being job pulled yeah that was a bad monday went home had, had a chat with the wife how was the day well not great yeah tuesday came around i think it was worse than monday oh no uh Bought myself a bottle of red on the way home. <laughs> and I think that bottle of red lasted about 15 minutes. Tough week. Huh? My wife asked me, how was, how was Tuesday? And she seen, she seen what happened and she was like, okay, I'll leave you to this. And about by Wednesday, Thursday, she was like, all right, pity party over. You know, get around to it. And based since then, it's been all right. Like I think they, there, was a, there was a lot of people pulling out of jobs not because their business fundamentals have changed. Like I'm not, I don't work with, you know, retailers or cafes, right? No, no companies are massively hit, but there's just a hesitation of the unknown. Mm, People don't know what's going to happen. So, oh, okay, if we're working from home, how am I going to onboard somebody remotely? Or is my company going to be affected? Am I going to then have to put this person off in a couple of months? So the hesitation. So I think it was more hesitation and unknown than anything, than more business fundamental changes. So after that couple of days, I think it's all sort of settled out companies some companies are are more forward than others in understanding where we will onboard remotely we will you know interview on board everything remotely um and they've had success doing that i think a lot of companies have realized hey we we do need to continue to operate and to do so we need people in our teams and to do that we're going to have to onboard them remotely so yeah i think there's been a lot of companies some done it better than others but in general most of them are moving in that direction so on the positive side i think what it's done is fast tracked it it's yeah. fast tracked. It's, it's put five years, five maybe ten. I don't at least five years, right? I think it would have been before remote work was uh, just a norm. There's a lot of companies in Newcastle and elsewhere that are like, "Oh, you have to be in the office. If you're not in the office, you know, you know, what are you doing?" Um, yeah. 
or we can't trust you to take your, your laptop home because, you know, data and this type of thing. It's just like, so it's forced a bunch of companies to adapt and adapt quickly. Yeah. So I think there's a real positive there for everyone to say, hey, we've had to adapt with the times and the pandemic's forced that upon us. It wouldn't happen otherwise, right? Well, that's right. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of change and um, you see the memes getting around, you know, what yeah. what drove your digital transformation, yeah. COVID-19, you know? Exactly. So, um yeah, it's 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 a good thing. I think in the long run, it'd be a real positive that we'll look back and go, yeah, we did make that that big step change. But um, well, I'm glad you come through it. Anyway, that's 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 a positive. And, yeah, um, and Newcastle isn't really positive. Like we've got a bunch of companies hiring right now. It's a really good spot at the moment. So I think there's a little bit of nervousness again. Yeah. Because uh, right now Newcastle seems to be on the brink there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But yeah, hey, I, I think a lot of companies, nearly across the board, would be better prepared this time around. Yeah. Cool. And um, do you think there are any other challenges we face here in Newcastle that, that you want to touch on? Yeah, I think um, I think lack of talent. Um, oh, not lack, just shortage. So how, how do we fix really, that? Really good talent. I think there's a car, uh, there's a couple of things, um, but probably both push and pull. Like so, I think uh, the university is really good for Newcastle. I think the university does churn out some really good talent. So, uh, trying to keep them here. Yeah. Back in the days, again, I think there wasn't opportunities for people coming out of university to stay local mm. they would have had to go to sydney that's not the case anymore so they can stay local so over time the more people coming out of university and staying locally we'll build our talent base up i think covid will help us because i think more people are realizing you don't need to live in a big city anymore mm. rents are cheaper in newcastle than they are in sydney right um you can live near a beach have a better life so so moving here once again that'll add talent to the area um and then from the other side is just those companies continuing to progress continuing to use new technologies to provide opportunities that are, people want to do right like you want to be attracted to your job like and to to have you know get a good feeling about what you're doing what your company's doing so if those companies continue to grow we got some cool projects on locally people want to stay here so yeah i think that's probably twofold there yeah cool Okay, well, you, you touch on university as a good segue into education. It's always my favorite topic and favorite question for your guests and um, people can go back and listen to my answer. But uh, t- you tell us, why, why do you think uh, or what are your thoughts, I guess, on the importance of, of a university degree, both, I guess, in the future for tech professionals, but really just more broadly? Yeah, I think I've changed. If we went back and cut out my comments in this question every time, I think I've changed it so many times. I did a university degree. I was... I didn't turn up very often. Um, <laughs> I, I, I pretty much the, those 10 marks that for a lot of the courses where you get one mark for every time you turn up, I pretty much gave myself, oh, I'm trying to get out of 90. I'm, I'm never going to get 100 because I might go to a couple. I did a lot of the stuff online. Um, but I think there was some really good foundations. The more I think about it now, the more I think, you know, I did macro and microeconomics and things like that, things that I wouldn't know have thought about, like change management. Um, that I wouldn't think provided me any value. But I think in these days, days you're like, oh, where did I actually learn that? It's probably back there. It's probably back at uni. So I think it's, a, yeah, everyone has different experiences there. I probably didn't turn up enough. It was probably just the age I was and the space I was at in life where maybe partying was a little bit more important uh-huh. to me at that stage. But my uh, university as a whole, I think um, I think it's, it's not for everyone, but I think it's really important. Yeah, I think the best answer or the most common answer that I've agreed with is is that it provides a really solid base level of which to grow. Um, that learning how to learn is a big one. I'm a massive fan of, of learning in general, um, continual learning. I think university provides that. It's probably also a bit of a you get out of it what you put in. So I probably didn't have as great an experience because I didn't put in enough. But I think the future, I think it will continue to be a part of the education system, just not in its current format. Yeah, I think the three-year degree or the four-year degree where you come in and you do the, the degree as, as laid out will continue to change and it might be, it might, be, it might change over time where you, you can add in some external providers as well to sort of to build up that sort of that, that mm. education portfolio. Um, Alex Mendez, I had on the podcast only recently, he provided a really good understanding of how they, how they build a university degree with the, the first two years often not changing with just all the core subjects yeah. and then the, the 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 third year you know you add in your new stuff yeah. i think it'll continue to change like that so i think it'll always be a part of always maybe a bit strong i think it'll for the, for the near enough future will be a part of an education 
I just don't think it's the be all and end all. I think there's a lot of other external providers where you can add in different parts. And I think that might be the future. Yeah, I just listened to the, your podcast with Alex and I, I thought that was a really great way of describing um, sort of, you know, the, the phases and that those sort of core fundamentals are in the early years and then later in, in the degree or the later years, you're sort of focusing on uh, the skills that you need to come out with and, and, and be active oh, and in the market. Honestly, process. for me, that was that was so eye-opening. Oh, yeah, and, the light bulb went off for me too, yeah. And I, I had massive respect to Alex and even more respect for the University of Newcastle and just university in general after hearing that. I was like, okay. So they are, they do think about staying relevant, that type of thing. I just think there will be a continual change with the university degree won't be as it is now in the future. And what about that postgraduate style learning? Have you done any of that yourself or looked into that? I signed up for a master's. I lasted two subjects. Yeah. Um, and then I think I was probably at the time more held pregnant. Okay. Pregnant for baby two maybe. And it's just not for me. It's just not my learning. Uh, even for those two subjects, I found myself up at midnight the night before, you know, the, the assignment's due and I'm, I'm cracking it out from like 6 p.m. till 12 p.m. to just get it done and I was submitting it at 11.58 um, just because it was due by 12. And that's, if, if that's what you're doing, that's probably not, you know, it's probably not the way to be doing it. Degree. I wasn't immersed in it. Um, so yeah. I don't think I'll ever touch, I'll do one. Yeah, I still go back and forth on it myself. I mean, I've sort of moved more into, I guess, management roles now and, and you, know, you still hear, oh, you need an MBA or you need to get an MBA. And um, yeah, it's definitely hard to fit in, I guess, with what you're doing. But I, I have a lot of friends and, and known a lot of people that have been quite successful getting that postgraduate degree, even without, you know, the, the undergrad and they're yep. just based on sort of work experience and that. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot of options. I think there's there. a lot of value. I've heard a lot of people that have done an MBA or done other, other versions of masters and things like that have had a lot of success with that and they've enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. So once again, it's probably, it's, it's probably horses for courses. It's, you know, some people get a lot out of it. Other people, I heard somebody refer to it as a divorce course <laughs> um, because it's so intense and then, you know, you're having so much, immersiveness in, into that degree and then you're also trying to you know you've, you've got a young family as well right like yeah. trying to juggle that a full-time job and, and an mba it, it's pretty hectic yeah yeah cool so i guess from your perspective you get to see a lot of um, really interesting jobs uh on the market um you probably got an insight insight into salaries um the type of work people are doing you know really having that sort of broad range of things i mean where do you think if people are looking to go and get a degree or maybe you're in that later stages or even early in their tech career based on what you're seeing and the salaries and the type of work people are doing and, and the other perks and that what should people be focused on if they're sort of at that stage and listening right now? just doing something they enjoy I think just doing something you enjoy. If you do something you're enjoying, you're, you're probably going to do pretty well at it. I've seen some people that are doing something for the sake of it's paying well and, you know, they do the job, but they'll, they'll probably stagnate at some point. Whereas the people that I really see succeed are the people that love what they do, right? Like Liam had a chat to Sean Bailey. He's actually joined NRV only recently on on his podcast. And, um, mate, he got, a, he got his job essentially because I think well, one of the key factors in what he did was he, he built a bunch of side projects like in his own time. Like a guy like that, young fella, he's come out, he, he stands above the pack because he, he loves what he's doing, right? Mm. Like there's other people who are building side projects or building something in their own time because they just love tech, right? Like I, I placed a dude the other week, you know, like as a tech support role and the guy's built like 16 PCs for him, his mates and his family and things like that. He just loves technology. He's got, he's got his own little lab set up at home. I think if somebody really loves what they do, they'll succeed. If I had this to just say broadly, hey, where they're going to continue to be jobs for the next five years, software development, right? Software developers yeah. in Newcastle are in demand. There's plenty of opportunity for them. And I think you could get a software development in job. Like I think, you, I think I could get a software development role in Newcastle within 12 months right now with me having zero experience. Like if I went and did some free online training, and built some stuff on the side, I think I could get myself at least an entry-level role in, in that just by being self-taught, showing some initiative, building some stuff in my own time. There's plenty of free online learning out there. Mm. There's no, there's nothing stopping you from learning, right? I think there's plenty of opportunity there. Just people just show a little bit of initiative. So I think in general, hey, if, if what, what do you just f- figure out what you want to do? Yeah. And even if you don't know what it is, what you want to do, right? Like you're doing some stuff in machine learning and things these days, which wasn't around, you know, yeah, 10 right. years ago. But you just, you know, as you're going through your career, you get your eyes on something, you, you pick up a little bit more about that and then you run with it, right? Opportunities like that, you know, will present themselves 
if you are opening those doors or sort of opening the doors for for yourself really yeah i think your point earlier about having that um passion passion for learning and and um if there is something you're interested in, there's so much free content out there right now, whether it's podcasts or, or blog posts or short courses or whatever it is. You know, you want to know about machine learning, you, you can go and learn that now in your own home for free. Yeah, you know, it's, from, it's from some of the best people in the world. Well, that's right? right, Stanford universities and, and everywhere else. Yeah, yeah, it's quite amazing. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about you. I guess you're a busy guy. Um, you do a lot of running around. Do you have any sort of productivity tools that, that you use to sort of manage your, your day-to-day or, or keep you moving? I, I think I've downloaded and bought nearly every productivity tool or app there is. Uh, what I've, I've actually been doing pretty well for probably the last six months now, I've been trying to do Inbox Zero um, and okay. working with that um, just because my emails were out of control before before that. I was, I was nearly a just select all archive and start from scratch. Yep. Any particular app or tool or anything using? No, for that, I just did a little bit. I just using Gmail, but I just um, I there's some online. I just found something online that showed, showed how to set up your inbox with you know the different styling and things like that, and then how to operate with that. So I've been using that and uh, just the Gmail tasks, like the, the out of the Google Suite, the tasks feature. So I don't use that. I used to pop, pop it all in my calendar. And my calendar was an absolute mess. It was a basket case. If you looked at it, you'd be like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> um, so tasks and inbox zero are probably my, my two things I'm, I'm trying to run with at the moment. I use Evernote. I've used that for, for years. I think it's got good, good search functionality. But yeah, that's, that's, prob- that's probably it at the moment. Um, I've tried you know, plenty of other habit tracking apps and things like that. And I'll still chime into one or two of those from time to time when I'm trying to, you know, get better on my exercise or my diet or, or my reading or even tried meditation at one stage um, yeah. just different things to try to you know get it form habits yeah, it's not always easy right yeah yeah absolutely and are you using anything to sort of help manage sort of the workload and the stress levels and anything like that any tools or techniques that you yeah can do? i think that's probably where i've dropped the ball over the past six months i think mm-hmm. uh running a small business has its challenges running a small business through COVID had challenges growing business challenges trying to build processes in place that, you know, I've gone from essentially myself recruiting to now three people recruiting, you know, a lot of the things were up in my head, right? So building out the processes for that and things like that, it's just challenging and it just takes time. So I don't think I've probably managed that overly well. I think my, you know, my going to the gym dropped off, my alcohol intake through COVID probably increased, <laughs> my lack of quality food probably uh, increased. I probably haven't managed. I probably haven't managed that perfectly over the, or definitely not perfectly, but not even well over the past like three or four months in particular. Yeah. But I try and get back on that bandwagon. I think just life in general, you can't always be running a hundred percent at everything, right? Um, I don't probably do balance overly well when I'm all in on something. I'm all in. Yeah. yeah. And when I'm not, I'm not. So yeah. I find when I get back in the gym, I'll eat better, and everything sort of you know falls into place there. If I'm not going to the gym, then I, I you know. I tend to eat more takeaway and all the rest of it. So I just try and get back in the swing. It swings and roundabouts. And what about collaboration tools? Your team's growing, as you mentioned. I, I assume most of you are sort of spending time remote as well and yeah. living in different parts. Like, are you using anything around collaboration there that, that you could recommend? Yeah. Um, oh, we use we, all the basics, right? We use the G Suite. So we use um, yeah, the G Suite across the board. We use Zoom. We use uh, Slack. We use uh, – we, we've got a, a recruitment-specific CRM tool. That we use and we're trying to make more and more use out of that's probably been one of the, the bigger changes over the last couple of weeks is just like really trying to nail that get that working for us because like most crm tools which everyone everyone would have this understanding that there's capability for days with those things we probably use 10 percent of it right yeah so trying to use a little bit more it's not the tool's fault it's the fact that we don't use it properly right yeah so trying to make that work for us um is something we're focused on lately yeah that'll just continue to work i think yeah from a team's perspective just yeah email g suite um the fact that the g suite you can host everything online like it's it's so easy like, yeah. you can start a business in 10 minutes these days with buying a domain and setting up a g suite right yeah that's right so apart from this one of course what, what are you listening to what sort of podcasts have you got on play right now or, or, or books or what are you sort of reading or listening to i've always like i got an, one of those audible subscriptions and get a, a book a month type thing and I, I try to read a little bit as well i think probably favorite books I revisited The Obstacle is Away by Ryan Holiday just recently. I think it was super relevant for, uh, for the times and the challenging times yeah. we're going through. Like, I, I, it's probably one of my favorite books. Joshua Waiskin's got a book called The Art of Learning, which is super, it's 
probably one of my favorites again. Okay. Um, I've just revisited that for the second time. There's another one. Ray Dalio's got a book called Principle. Yeah, great one. Yeah, good so one. So I've got that now in ebook form, hard copy form, <laughs> and on Audible. I think that's super, super, super relevant for me at the moment in setting up. Essentially, it's about you know setting up the key principles of which you can build a business or build your life, and then everything else sort of sits on top of that. Yeah. And you get those key principles right, like everything else sort of manages itself. So that was super relevant for me. I, like it, it just spoke to me. So that was super interesting. Uh, from a podcast perspective, I just change it up all the time. Um, I like to try to listen to podcasts to help myself get better as an interviewer. I think um, I listen back now. I have a chat to Janaya who edits all the podcasts. So she listens to my voice more than everyone. And she's like, hey, the differences between episode one and episode 50 is like night and day and you know, how I communicate. Um, always trying to sort of improve that. So I, I can listen to different people, Tim Ferriss, Lewis Howes, James Altucher, Brendan Schwab, Joe Rogan. I think I just change it up all the time. Um, there's a dude at the moment who I've, I've listened to about five of his podcasts on, on the different podcast episodes he's been on. His name's Jesse Itzler. He's, a, he's like an entrepreneur guy out of the US, but he's got like four kids. Uh, he's married to Sarah Blakely, who was the founder of Spanx. So like super power couple in the entrepreneurial world. But for me, I'm like, hey, he's a super entrepreneurial guy running businesses and managing his family really well. He runs ultra marathons as well, which I have zero interest in. <laughs> yeah. um, but he seems to manage fitness and the life, the, the work and the life and all that well, which is important to me. It's something I'm really, really focused on. It's just trying to be, you know, a, a good family man as well as running a business. Yeah, yeah. How are you following these people? Like, are these these types of people putting out the best information? You think that yeah, you want yeah. to follow? Yeah, the other dude's probably Naval Ra- uh, Ravikant. Ra- Ravikant, yeah. 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 Uh, like he's he's got one really really popular tweet storm, mm. and it's just phenomenal. Um, Every time it comes up, I retweet it. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I do the same, and I down. He's got like a podcast short podcast version of it now as well. Like that dude, that guy, like for just business and life, I think he's, he's bang on. And every time I read, it, I'm like, ah. Oh, I should read that like on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. um, there's so much, so much relevance there. Yeah. Oh, I've always wanted to say this, but we'll put it in the show notes. So um, <laughs> we'll have it there for you. And so I guess we're getting towards the end. I mean, what, what do you think you've learned so far? A pretty varied journey. I mean, what, what sort of advice or what sort of learnings would you pass on to your younger self if, um, if, if they could have a listen to this? Yeah. Younger version of myself, I would have probably said listen more. Okay. Um, I think I was a, I don't think, I was definitely not the best employee through my times, both in marketing and recruitment. I think I probably thought I knew more than I did. I probably spoke more than I listened. And I always got told, oh, you know, you should listen more. You should. And I was like, ah, I know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, like people have got to hear what I've got to say. And these days I, I realized that I didn't know what I was talking about and I probably should have shut my mouth and just listened a little bit more. So I probably would have told myself to that and probably just that and probably gratitude. Gratitude is probably something I've really bought into probably the last five years is just like, just be thankful for what I've got. Like you don't always need to be at the next stage. You don't always need the next the next job, the next big thing, the next pay rise, the next whatever it is. Just if you live a little bit more presently and just be happy for what you got, like life seems to be okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. No, spot on, spot on. Well, thanks for your time. I'm, I'm really glad we did this. Um, episode 50, we, we made it this far and um, – I'm looking forward to the big party at episode 100, maybe a live audience or something like that. When, I do, you do. If we make episode 100, we'll do a live audience and I'll right. put on the, the, the food and beverages. Big party, two years post-pandemic, hopefully. And, uh, <laughs> if we're allowed. Yeah, that's <laughs> or right. Or we might well be sitting there at masks. That's right. That's right. So where can people find you if they want to follow you and hear more from you? Yeah, mate, probably most of it's on LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn's probably, probably not everyone's favorite place, actually. Uh, I know especially a lot of people in technology don't like LinkedIn at the moment because of recruiters. But I put out a lot of my content on there. Um, we cut up like smaller parts of our episodes and put it on there. But we've got uh, obviously the podcast is on. Uh, it's on Apple and Spotify. We've got a video version on YouTube. We do a lot of our like little edits on there as well. So yeah, and then it'll all be we've got a brand new new tech website, a new tech people website going up soon. But everything's all on our website as well. So newtechpeople.com.au. All right. Thanks very much, James. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs>